Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's talk. We will get started momentarily after we give a minute or so for people to log on. We thank you very much for joining us. Um, so welcome and good afternoon, everyone. A happy Lunar New Year, Xinyan Kuai Le, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Yawen Lei. I am an associate professor in the Department of Sociology at Harvard University. I'm also a faculty member at the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies. I'm delighted to announce a new webinar series, Contemporary Chinese Society at the Fairbank Center. We will have four speakers this semester. All of them are doing uh, cutting edge and very important research that advances our understanding of contemporary Chinese society. And today uh, it's our great honor to have Professor Ethan Michelson uh, give an inaugural talk for the new series. Dr. Michelson is a professor of sociology, professor of law, and the chair of the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at the Indiana University Bloomington. And he is one of the most prominent scholars who study law and society in China. And today he is going to give a talk based on his forthcoming book titled Decoupling, Gender Injustice in China's Divorce Courts, which will be published by Cambridge University Press this year. And just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions uh, during the presentation, uh, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel. Uh, we will have time for Professor Michelson to answer the questions at the end. And now, without further ado, I'm going to turn the time over to Professor Michelson. Welcome, Professor Michelson. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, happy Chinese New Year to um, all of you. Um, this is a real honor to kick off this exciting new lecture series on contemporary Chinese society. Um, and I want to thank you, uh, Yao Wen, for in inviting me. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here and to present um, my forthcoming book. Um, this is Definitely going to be a race against the clock, so let me just get straight to it. Um, and, and apologies for uh, talking quickly, um, but rest assured uh, that I will shut up after my allotted time elapses. Um, and in the interest of time, uh, I need to dispense with proper uh, acknowledgments, but I'll simply mention quickly uh, that this book rests on a lot of knowledge um, about uh, Chinese divorce litigation that I gained from my first PhD student, um, Ke Li, who's at the City University of New York's John Jay School, and whose own book on the topic is coming out soon from Stanford University Press. So I'm, I'm really um, indebted to her. Um, hopefully you can see the cover of the book that was um, in the, the Fairbank ad for today's talk. Let me just quickly mention that the e-edition of this book will be open access at the price of $0. So if you're okay reading this book on an e-reader or a computer screen, uh, you should ignore uh, Cambridge's hardcover price of $155. Since the ad for this talk includes the book cover, uh, which is, you should be able to see on the, on the Zoom screen here, let me begin here. So decoupling, uh, the main title, it's a double entendre. The first meaning is literal. It refers to the decoupling of married spouses. Family sociologists are a little more familiar with the word uncoupling for breakups and divorces, but I, I chose to use decoupling because uh, at another level, it also refers to a gap between official promises of the law and the degree to which courts fulfill them in practice. Loose coupling and decoupling are core concepts in the sociology of organizations and institutions. Uh, in essence, this book uses the case of marital decoupling to shed light on institutional decoupling. The sociological literature on decoupling is similar, but actually surprisingly decoupled from gap studies in the law and society literature. So gap studies are intended to assess the impact of law by measuring 
the gap between black letter law and judicial behavior, between legal promises and legal practices, between the law in the books and the law in action, between legal form and legal substance, between legal ideals and legal results, between legal appearance and legal reality. So you, you get the idea. Uh, and this is exactly what I mean by, by decoupling. So the, and the, the visual image um, of the, um, the book cover, it, it represents this yawning gap um, between all those things, right? Or the rift. It also symbolizes tearing up the law on paper or tearing up a marriage license. In this talk today, I'm gonna to focus on the Sisyphean struggle to get divorced in China's courts, particularly among women seeking to divorce their abusive husbands. Uh, in her recent book on lower courts in Russia, uh, Catherine Hendley at the University of Wisconsin pushes back um, against what she calls a parade of horribles narrative about courts in authoritarian political contexts. Uh, I wish I could do the same. Um, with this project. So this, this is a, a bit of a trigger warning that divorce cases in China really do make a parade of horribles. Chinese divorce litigation, it's, it's truly um, a horror show. Um, China's laws on the books um, and official commitments to protecting women um, actually are most impressive. And I'm, I'm not gonna belabor this point. Um, I have an entire chapter in the book, which I title the right to decouple um, on, on this point, but um, uh, basically the freedom of divorce and gender equality are, are foundational principles, not just in China, but in the socialist world uh, more, more generally, kind of going back to the, to the 1930s and then enshrined in the 1950 marriage law, which actually was the first body of law enacted um, by the, the People's Republic. Um, you know, with the and, and long before the 2015 anti anti domestic law, and sorry, it's supposed to be anti domestic violence law, um, took effect in March 2016. China had a huge arsenal of laws designed to combat and, and punish um, domestic uh, violence. It's it signed, you know, all um, core international human rights treaties, ratified all but one of them. Um, it's signed and ratified uh, CEDAW. Um, so China's commitments to upholding, you know, these, these global legal norms um, uh, are, um, you know, seen in, in this um, and in many, many other parts of its domestic laws. And there, uh, there's public security administrative punishment, which offers protection against the maltreatment and abuse of family members. And this goes way back. Um, over the past 20 years or so, China has, has built a domestic violence warning um, system. Um, these are local systems for the, the most part um, to offer protection uh, to women and punishment uh, to, to abusers. The rules of evidence are very clear, um, giving abuse victims the, the benefit um, of the doubt, you know, in, in, uh, in cases that kind of boil down to he said, uh, she said scenarios. Um, so the, the book shows how all of these things, right, these impressive legal protections are totally decoupled from judicial practices. Um, in short, and quoting from the title of chapter three, court behavior is decoupled from the right to decouple. If everything we knew about divorce litigation were from the laws themselves, we'd have a very distorted picture of, what, of what's going on. In the divorce litigation process, courts ignore sideline and even subvert the very legal principles of divorce rights and gender equality they symbolically uh, embrace. So, so how do I support this, this argument? It's sort of um, a, uh, a big data project in the sense that I analyzed tens of thousands of divorce cases from, from two uh, provinces, uh, Henan and Zhejiang. Since 2013, China's Supreme People's Court has required all courts in China to post almost all of their decisions online. I mean, there, there are some exceptions, the types of cases that courts are not allowed to, to post, um, but the, the Supreme People's Court started encouraging courts to, to post their decisions online even earlier, um, going back to the late 2000s, like 2008, 2009 is when courts started to post uh, court decisions in, in large numbers. Um, and uh, then, um, so, Beginning, you know, after 2013, um, you know, court decisions were being posted en masse in just massive uh, numbers. Uh, then um, the Supreme People's Court ordered courts to stop posting divorce decisions specifically 
um, beginning in October 2016. So my sample um, of about um, of almost 150,000 um, divorce decisions divided pretty evenly between the Henan and Zhejiang um, uh, span 2009 uh, to 2016. So let's start to look at some grim findings. Um, I'm gonna kind of zoom out first of all to uh, a macroscopic view of the full sample of court uh, of, of divorce cases. And then I'll zoom in to a more microscopic view of individual um, cases. So let me start with some key uh, and pretty alarming um, findings. First, 25% uh, of all divorce petitions were filed by women making domestic violence allegations against their, their husbands. And this 25%, it reflects the fact that two thirds of all plaintiffs uh, are women. Uh, and almost 40% of these, of the petitions, the divorce petitions that they file for divorce. So 40% of the, the petitions filed by women, right, who account for two thirds of all plaintiffs uh, include claims of marital um, abuse. Um, of all divorce petitions containing domestic violence allegations, fewer than 2% were granted by, by judges on this basis. Some um, of these uh, petitions that contain domestic violence allegations were granted, but for other reasons, typically. Um, usually uh, when, when the defendant, you know, the husband um, consented uh, to the divorce or if the, the defendant was absent, um, the, the judges were more inclined to grant the, um, uh, the petition. Um, and part of the reason why uh, so few of these divorce petitions were granted is because few divorce petitions are granted in general. Um, courts denied the vast majority of divorce petitions containing domestic violence allegations, I mean, huge proportions. Um, the, this lines up actually pretty closely to the denial rates for all uh, cases. So the point is that domestic violence cases are not really any different from, from cases in, in general. Uh, judges don't really treat domestic violence cases any differently than they treat other kinds of uh, cases. Um, now, when they deny divorce petitions, this causes delays, huge delays. Um, there's a statutory waiting period of six months, and then, and then women have to go back to, to file uh, a new uh, divorce petition, and the delays are typically about one year. And using some back-of-the-envelope math to extrapolate um, to China as a whole, right, from, from my collections of cases from uh, Henan and Zhejiang, uh, the upshot is that, very conservatively speaking, at least 90,000 women beaten by their husbands have been exposed to further violence, um, typically for another year after courts deny their divorce petitions. This is 90,000 per year, and this is a very conservative um, estimate. A lot of um, them, you know, when they're waiting for a new trial, like a new opportunity to file uh, a divorce petition, they go into hiding um, and, and become what I call uh, domestic violence refugees. Um, and this is sort of the, the flight part, right? Be, you know, fleeing domestic abuse. Um, uh, that's the, the flight part of the story of fight or flight. Um, a lot of criminal domestic violence cases. Um, so outside of the divorce courts, now we're talking about criminal courts. So criminal domestic violence cases, including marital homicides, involved women who had previously attempted to divorce in court, right? And their, their cases were denied and they were further exposed um, to, to domestic violence and were murdered by their husbands. Um, or it's the fight part of the story of fight or flight a significant proportion of all women incarcerated for violent crime in China were convicted of murdering their abusive husbands, um, and often while waiting um, for a new opportunity to file uh, a new divorce petition. Uh, I devote an entire chapter of the book to this issue of fight or flight. Finally, um, almost uh, one out of five women um, in Hunan who did secure a divorce on the first try um, gave up property or child custody claims in order uh, to do so. And this is something that, um, that Kuli um, has found um, and, and is a big part of, um, uh, of her research, exchanging property and child custody for, for freedom uh, from, 
from toxic marriages and from uh, domestic violence in particular. So it, it took me about two years to do the empirical research behind this book. Um, that part um, was a fairly enjoyable process of, of discovery, I, I guess as enjoyable as studying such a depressing topic can be. Um, and, and then after that, it took me another two years to actually write it up into readable text, right? Writing the chapters. And, and that part was excruciatingly painful. I mean, just the process, the mechanical process of writing, um, you know, constructing sentences and paragraphs, um, that was really hard. But when the, when the writing process was particularly miserable, miserable, I would remind myself that that two years is how long it often takes abused women in China to finalize their divorces. So in the book, I move back and forth between aggregate statistical analysis of the cases in my collection and in-depth narrative analysis of individual cases. And I'll, I'll try and do uh, the same in this um, presentation. Let, let me start with um, a little bit, of, little bit of context. So this figure um, on the screen now, um, I, I created from official government statistics, um, not from my collection of court decisions. Um, this figure shows the proportion of divorce petitions granted in divorce trials or divorce adjudications. And we can see a conspicuous um, decline uh, um, in rates at which divorces were granted uh, over time. So we're beginning in the early 2000s. Um, in terms of absolute numbers of cases, so like this, this figure shows the proportion of cases of divorce petitions that were granted by adjudication. But in terms of absolute numbers of cases, um, between the year 2000 and the year 2018, so that's kind of the, the period of, of this judicial clampdown on divorce, the total number of divorce requests denied by court adjudication each year, it more than tripled over this period of time. Um, while the annual number of divorce requests granted by court adjudication each year declined, um, by the time we get to 2015, 2016, 2017, and so on. So in, in more recent years, only about 40% of divorce adjudications resulted in an actual divorce. And compare that to the mid 2000s when, when it was about 70%. So this is a huge decline in, in the proportion of divorce petitions actually granted. Um, so this is what I call the judicial clampdown on, on divorce. Um, but, but these lines here, they actually obscure some really important dynamics. And, and this is what I want everybody to be clear about, to, to understand. These lines here, the lines for China as a whole, for, for Hunan and, and for Zhejiang, the lines, they, they double count a lot of divorces. Um, the lines show all divorce adjudications in China as, as a whole and, and the two provinces, right? But, but actually, a lot of these, um, and probably most of these are multiple adjudications of the same case. Uh, let me explain. China's civil procedure law provides an exception for divorces to the general rule that the second instance trial is the final instance. So for every other type of case, or almost every other type of case, litigants get one chance to appeal a first instance verdict. Divorces um, get a litigation do-over when judges deny them. So for this reason, divorce petitions could conceivably and, and sometimes do become Groundhog Day for, uh, uh, you know, that, that are refiled and retried in perpetuity. And, and this does sometimes um, happen. You, you'll all, you might also note that the line for Zhejiang is considerably lower than the line for, for Hunan. So divorce is a lot harder to get in Zhejiang uh, than in, in Hunan. Um, I, I don't have time to get to delve into this two province comparison today, um, but um, uh, what, what I wanna do next is, is to separate first attempts from subsequent attempts, right? Now that we know that um, a, a lot of divorces are denied on the first attempt and then are refiled after a statutory six month waiting period, Let's, let's separate the probabilities of, of get, you know, a divorce petition being granted by first attempt filings and subsequent attempt uh, filings. We can't do that with official government statistics, but we can do that with the, um, uh, with, with the cases in my, in my collections. So you wanna, you wanna focus, well, first of all, 
the um, the 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 line here with you know, the um, the dots. That's the exact same line that we just saw for Hunan in the previous figure. The solid line here um, is uh, the the basically my effort to replicate that from my collection of court decisions that I scraped from uh, the um, uh, from the websites, um, and you can see they're very very similar. So in in in, uh, in Zhejiang as as well. So the line that I constructed from my collection or you know, my sample of cases is very, very similar to official government statistics in both provinces. Um, now let's look at the line below that, the dashed lines. Those dashed lines here for, for Hunan and down here for Zhejiang, these are limited to first attempts, right? The first try getting a divorce uh, in court. And remember what I just said, it typically takes two or more attempts to get a divorce in court. It sometimes takes three, four, five or more uh, attempts. Sometimes judges will never grant the divorce, no matter how many times uh, a plaintiff files. So basically, what, what happens is, you know, a, a woman, and they're typically women, right? The majority of plaintiffs are women, uh, goes to court seeking a divorce on the grounds of, of marital abuse. And the judge says, sorry, it's not going to happen today. Come back in six months and try again. Uh, and this, this is a, a routine, kind of universal practice uh, in courts across China. I didn't discover this. It's, it's actually quite a well-known uh, phenomenon. So most plaintiffs get turned away the first time they file for divorce um, and their, their chances of getting divorced um, uh, a, a diminished, diminished dramatically between 2009 and 2016. So that, that's the, the clampdown. Um, so um, in Hunan, in 2015, only 25% um, of petitions led to actual divorces on the first try. Uh, only 18%, um, so less than one in five, um, led to a successful divorce in Zhejiang in, in, uh, in 2016. What about subsequent attempts? So this is on the first try. So very few, your, your chances of getting divorced on the first try are pretty slim. Um, if you go back for a second try, or actually it's, I, I lumped together all subsequent attempts, whether it's a th second, third, or fourth attempt, it's a subsequent try. Then your chances uh, are, are much, much higher, 75% in, in, uh, in uh, Hunan and 76% in, uh, in Zhejiang. So um, the plaintiffs who went back for another try were generally um, successful, but that's if you define success as actually getting divorced. The cost of this success was often giving up property and child custody, as I mentioned before. So judges are hell-bent on denying first attempt divorce petitions. They, they twist and subvert the law in order to do so, even when it means ignoring domestic violence allegations. They won't let anything, not even domestic violence allegations, get in their way of this universal practice. Uh, which significantly prolongs women's exposure to violence. Now let's further disaggregate the dashed lines by plaintiff sex to see if judges have treated women and men uh, differently. Um, and we, we'll, we'll see, let's look at, at Hunan first. Uh, women have borne the brunt of this, uh, the judicial clampdown on, on divorce. Most of the toll has been paid by by women. Women have been disproportionately subjected to this clampdown. You can see that you know, women's probability of success is much, much lower than, than men's, more than, uh, more than 10 percentage points lower than, than men's. Um, and same thing in, um, uh, in, 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 uh, in Zhejiang. Given that so many women um, seeking divorce uh, are seeking to escape their abusive husbands, this massive gender gap reflects almost unthinkable gender injustice. Uh, about 40% of female plaintiffs claim to have been abused by their husbands. For this reason, strictly according to the law, courts should be more likely to grant the petitions of female plaintiffs than those of male plaintiffs, right? I mean, if so many women are seeking divorce on the grounds of domestic violence, and if domestic violence is, is grounds for divorce, then, then all else equal. I mean, women should be more likely than men to get their divorces granted, but it's exactly the opposite. In fact, claims of domestic violence do not move the needle towards divorce. On the contrary, they're, they're somewhat counterproductive. 
So how do judges get away with clamping down on divorce by, by sidelining these claims of marital abuse? Uh, the answer is that they do so through their contorted uh, efforts to establish the existence of mutual affection despite allegations and evidence of marital violence. Judges' inscrutable logic defies and subverts China's laws protecting women from their abusive uh, husbands. So, so what does it take for a plaintiff to succeed on the first try? Um, basically, plaintiffs need to convince judges that mutual affection, that's the term, mutual affection has irrevocably broken down. Um, and, and women have a much harder time than men uh, doing so. So what the, what the law says, basically the key legal test for divorce in China is known as the breakdown of mutual affection, uh, This is, as you can see, it's Article 32 of the 2001 Marriage Law. It's now become Article uh, 1079, Article 1079 in the 2020 Civil Code, which took effect in uh, on January 1st, uh, 2021. So this legal standard, you know, the breakdown of mutual uh, affection standard, it's kind of an analog of no-fault divorce elsewhere in the world. It was intended to help people get out of unhappy marriages and, and to support ex parte or unilateral divorce on the basis of irreconcilable differences. But judges um, enjoy a huge amount of discretion uh, in the interpretation and application uh, of this divorce standard. In principle, if mediated reconciliation fails uh, and the plaintiff insists on divorcing, judges are supposed to grant uh, the divorce. But in practice, judges exercise almost limitless discretion <clears throat> to affirm the existence um, of reconciliation potential and therefore to disaffirm the breakdown of mutual uh, affection. When judges deny first attempt divorce petitions, they they tend to do so on the grounds or, or the, the pretext really, uh, that the marriage has not fallen apart, that the couple can still patch things up. Uh, judges' rulings then typically boil down to their assessments of the married couple's reconciliation potential. This is, you know, this is the, the legal language. Basically judges rule on divorce petitions according to the unknowable hypothetical future counterfactuals. Reconciliation potential almost always trumps domestic violence. That is to say, judges typically sideline, downplay, and trivialize domestic violence allegations by saying that reconciliation potential uh, is still there, right? That reconciliation is still possible despite uh, the, the abuse. But judges are not supposed to do this. Um, they're supposed to affirm the breakdown of mutual affection on the basis of statutory wrongdoing. And that's you know, what the rest of Article 32 shows here, the, these wrongdoing uh, standards. Uh, rarely though do judges actually uh, apply these, these wrongdoing or fault-based uh, standards. So, so the result is that no matter how egregious plaintiff's allegations of wrongdoing are, and no matter how well plaintiffs support and document their allegations of wrongdoing with evidence, Judges tend to say, well, yes, this is all very bad behavior, but you still haven't proven the breakdown of mutual affection. Judges tend to act in a paternalistic manner and with patronizing relationship advice of, of zero legal relevance. They, they infantilize litigants by acting as if they know what's best for them. Court decisions are, are bursting with hackneyed cliches um, written by these paternalistic judges professing to know better than the plaintiffs themselves and imploring plaintiffs to treasure the toxic marriages that they're desperate um, to exit. Finally, I mean, they could also, judges could also uh, affirm the breakdown of mutual affection on the basis of, of physical um, separation. So that's another, another legal test. Um, uh, and, and as you can see here, I, I underlined family violence, um, domestic violence, you know, that's, it's, so, so that is, is, is a statutory standard um, for, for granting a divorce and, and judges very, very rarely uh, apply this standard. They, they typically um, I I ignore it. Um, so I, I did regression analysis of the various factors that increased and decreased the probability of a court ruling to grant a divorce. And in the regression analysis, domestic violence allegations made no difference. Okay? They did not improve 
plaintiff's chances of getting divorced. Simply put, domestic violence doesn't matter to judges. Uh, judges simply don't care uh, about abuse victims' allegations and the evidence they submit to support them. They probably care on a personal level, but it's clear that they care a lot more about other things, the many other competing and countervailing pressures on their work, which, which are a big part of the book uh, that I don't have time to get into um, today. The, the upshot is that making domestic violence allegations makes not one iota of difference uh, in, in divorce um, court. Women seeking to divorce their abusive husbands, they presented uh, allegations of domestic violence in gruesome detail and meticulously documented them with evidence. They reported all manner of weapons used against them, including cleavers, fruit knives, daggers, single blade knives, folding knives, switchblade knives, long knives, machetes, scissors, sickles, hatchets, axes, pickaxes, trowels, hammers, shovels, pipes, rods, benches, folding stools, uh, and so on. They reported getting stabbed, cut, and hacked. They reported being choked, strangled, suffocated, and burned. They reported bone fractures, ruptured eardrums, broken noses, and concussions. Um, here on the, on the screen, on this slide, are 57 common violence words in divorce petitions. Uh, in the Hunan and Zhejiang samples of, uh, of divorce uh, cases, about half of plaintiffs' petitions contained at least one of these violence words. And of course, not surprisingly, there's a massive gender gap in the use of, of this uh, vocabulary. It was overwhelmingly women using this kind of uh, vocabulary. And, and in, in yellow here, these nine uh, violence words for, for um, battery, right? Different forms of, of beating, you know, violence, domestic violence, getting beaten, um, berated, cursed. So it's both physical and, um, uh, and, and verbal abuse, getting punched and, and kicked. And so just the, these nine words, 40, almost 40% 40 of female plaintiffs included at least one of these nine violence words in their divorce um, petitions. So does the use of words like these make a difference in outcomes or, or in, in how judges handle cases? In other words, do judges handle domestic violence cases any differently than they handle other cases? The answer is simply no, they don't. Plaintiff's allegations of domestic violence are pervasive, as I, as I just described, but they have virtually no influence on judges' rulings um, and, and in their holdings. Um, these words rarely, rarely appeared in judges' holdings. So this sort of language is just pretty much absent from judges' holdings uh, and, and rulings. Um, and we can see this just by doing a fairly rudimentary, a fairly simple um, sort of natural language processing um, analysis of the text, you know, the vocabulary this, of, uh, in, in judges' um, holdings. So, um, you know, I just wanted to compare the kind of language that judges um, used in cases as a whole and then in domestic violence cases in, in, in particular. And, and very quickly, I mean, I, I don't have, have time to get into uh, a lot of detail, but, you know, I constructed um, word clouds that just depict the frequency of, of words that, are, that appear and, and, uh, and are used in judges' holdings in two types of cases, um, denials, cases that were, were denied, and then in cases that involve domestic violence um, allegations. Uh, and domestic violence, the, the domestic violence cases are, are those that, um, uh, in which the plaintiff's petitions contain at least one of those nine uh, violence words that I highlighted in yellow um, before. No cases were double counted um, across these word clouds, so there's no overlap um, between the word clouds. Each case appears in only one word cloud, and they, they show that basically judges' vocabulary, their discourse was remarkably uniform, um, and, and both in, you know, uh, between the two provinces and between the two types of cases, denials in general and domestic violence cases. They're pretty much all, all the same. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of skip this, um, uh, the, the details, because I I'm, I'm, I'm really don't have, have, have time. I'm just going to kind of uh, plow ahead. Um, but, um, you know, basically, you know, just kind of doing a cursory scan of the kinds of words that uh, judges use shows that they, they recycle and rehash you know, boilerplate text, emphasizing plaintiff's failure to submit evidence, proving the breakdown of marital affection, 
you know, fuchi ganqing. You know, so this is that that's what's front and center, the, the marital affection or mutual affection. Judges assert that reconciliation remains possible if, if the couple will just work harder on their relationship skills, if they learn to forgive and forget and to compromise, to improve their communication skills, uh, and so on. I mean, this is the kind of language that is, is front and center in uh, judges' holdings and rulings. In essence, judges gaslight plaintiffs who have been abused by their husbands. They, they discursively transform what plaintiffs understand as intolerable and unlawful abuse constituting grounds for divorce into innocent misunderstandings and mistakes on the part of caring husbands. And in so doing, judges gaslight plaintiffs by, by calling into question their sense of reality. Um, let's now take a closer look at individual cases. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm mindful of, of, of time. And like I said, I'll just, I'll just get through as many as I can and then and then stop. But, but the, the individual cases, when, you, when you, you get out of the, you know, the aggregate sort of macroscopic analysis of the, the full corpus of, uh, of court decisions, and you look at the individual cases, you read them closely. And I, and I read hundreds and hundreds of cases uh, very closely. And you just see, I mean, truth is stranger than fiction. And you just can't make this stuff up. I mean, these court decisions are often legally preposterous. I mean, they, they, they may seem like impossibly outrageous uh, cases, um, but, but they're, they're actually utterly typical. Um, if they weren't so tragic, I mean, they would be, they would be comical. Um, and, and I often wasn't sure whether I should laugh or cry when I was, when I was reading these, um, these cases. Um, so consider this one, one case of a, I mean, it couldn't be clearer, right? The, the, the plaintiff um, included in her legal complaint, right, the, the divorce petition, uh, you know, all these horrible things that happened, hospitalization after, after the defendant caused a concussion and chest hemorrhaging, and then another hospitalization after the defendant cut her with, with the glass lining of a hot water thermos, smashed her over the head with a beer bottle, caused a cerebral hematoma, then another, a third hospitalization with a broken nose, fractured eye socket and ear contusion, uh, head and chest wounds, she had evidence, right, from, from police and hospital documentation. Um, and, and the defendant um, in his defense simply said, I don't consent to divorce. Marital relations are good. Both sides occasionally argue and fight, but afterwards were as good as new. Uh, and the court in its holding said in an epic understatement, in recent years, some conflict has emerged over family trifles. This is the kind of, you know, Jatin Swar, sure, this is the sort of language that's used, you know, trivial household matters. Last year, the defendant was on, you sure it was on the extreme side of contentious, but mutual affection has not declined to the level of complete breakdown. And on this basis, the, the court denied the plaintiff's um, request. There was, there was a case that, um, that hit the news um, in April of 2021 uh, of last year, spring of, of, of last year, uh, of a, um, so the, the plaintiff in this case, uh, Ning Xuanhua, had filed for divorce five times between 2017 and 2021. Um, she she uh, claimed in her petition that, that she discovered her husband, her husband, uh, Chen Dinghua's gambling problems, violent temper, and she left him uh, in 2017. So they'd been separated uh, for four years. So, and obviously satisfied the physical separation test and should have been, which should have been automatic grounds for, for, for a divorce. Um, she submitted medical documentation of a beating um, on, on the, so this is the fifth attempt, but there, there had been, even before the fifth divorce uh, uh, attempt, um, there was other kinds of evidence. Um, she had previously applied for personal protection orders against her husband. The court, the same court granted personal protection orders, which is also supposed to um, constitute evidence of domestic violence and therefore as, as grounds for, uh, for, for a divorce. Um, her husband had been held in administrative detention six times. Um, there was evidence of obviously that, that of, of, of his bad behavior should have been grounds for, for divorce. Um, he had submitted allegedly over a over hundred, he had given her, he had written over a hundred pledge letters. These are basically like apology letters or promise letters. Like, I'm sorry for beating you. I promise I'll never do it again. They're very, very common in divorce cases. They're supposed to be used as evidence of domestic violence. Um, 
but uh, uh, you know, courts are supposed to say, you know, these, these pledge letters, they're confessions, right? They're the husband's confessions of, of beating their wives and, and should be used as evidence of domestic violence and grounds for divorce. But instead, it's much more common for judges to use these letters to disaffirm the breakdown of mutual affection, right? Because the judge says, oh, look, look how, how much he loves you. He loves you. He's apologizing to you. He cares about you. He, he wants a new chance um, and to, uh, uh, to, to, to mend his, his ways. Um, so, um, you know, it, it was, it was, you know, there, there was no ambiguity. I mean, the, the law is extremely clear that, that her divorce should have been granted, but as, as we see so typically and so commonly, um, the, the courts did exactly, uh, the, the opposite. Um, I'm, I'm sort of skipping ahead. I, I kind of wanted to make the point about, about, um, uh, about how, how courts also use medical documentation. So all the medical documentation she submitted, right, showing her bruises, showing her injuries, uh, how extreme they were. Ju judges will very, very commonly say that the medical documentation only proves the occurrence of an injury, but it doesn't prove who caused the injury. So judges are often really reluctant to link the injury to the defendant. And they, the same thing with photos, like the ones that, that I just showed on, on the screen. It's like the judge will say, yep, you were really badly injured and I'm very sorry about that, but, but this doesn't prove that your husband's the one who caused uh, these injuries. And then defendants will claim that, you know, that, that these injuries were self-inflicted, right? The wife just did it to herself to, because she's mad at me. Um, or coincidental accidents, you know, she fell down the stairs that had nothing to do, to do with, with me. Um, you know, and so, you know, judges claim, well, you know, I'm, my, my hands are tied here because I, I have to side with the evidence. Like I can only, uh, I have to listen to the evidence. But in fact, that's not true. Um, the, the, the Chinese um, evidence law actually allows judges to, um, to give women the benefit of the doubt in, in situations like this. I don't, I don't have time to get into uh, the, the, the preponderance of evidence um, provisions in the law that judges are actually supposed to use in cases like this, but, uh, but they never, ever, ever do. Um, I looked in all these cases, I found like one or two out of 150,000 cases in which judges actually uh, 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 did that. Um, oh, and then meanwhile, I mean, the, 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 um, the, the husbands in these cases, they often will admit in court um, to, to committing uh, domestic violence. Like in this case, the, the husband said, you know, she, she became determined divorce, so I occasionally taught her a lesson. Uh, you know, and he's, he's complaining about how expensive it was to marry her, the bride price he paid. And it's like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give up so quickly. I'm not willing to divorce. Um, and and so, some, so I have to use, in order to keep her, keep her in line, I sometimes have to threaten and beat her. He's saying this, um, and we often see this in, in court decisions. In their defense statements, um, defendants will, will often uh, say, yeah, I, I occasionally beat her, but, it's, it's, but, I, but, but um, I apologized and I promise I'll never do it again, or I beat her and it wasn't that serious and therefore it doesn't constitute domestic violence. It doesn't rise to the level of, of domestic violence and, and judges will often make the same um, kinds of statements about yeah, you were beaten and you were injured, but it doesn't rise to the level of, of domestic uh, uh, violence. Judges are also very concerned about these, these violent men. They're very concerned that violent men will direct their anger at the judges themselves. Uh, they're concerned about their, their personal safety, um, but they're also concerned about um, being professionally punished in their performance evaluations um, for so-called extreme incidents that, uh, that, that threaten social stability, um, all important social stability and China's official stability maintenance um, efforts. So a, uh, an angry disgruntled um, husband who, uh, you know, takes out his anger uh, on his wife after a divorce, after a, a judge grants the divorce um, and hurts the wife that could come back um, to hurt the judge um, on because judges are liable, right? They, they assume lifelong professional uh, liability um, for 
improperly decided cases or, 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 uh, or decisions that lead to, um, that lead to complaints um, and, and, and petitions. So this is absolutely on judges' minds um, uh, uh, as well. So I think actually, I, I was gonna get into a, a lot of, uh, a lot more examples um, from my, my collection of, of cases. This is one that was in the, uh, in, in the newspapers uh, all over China. This, this was not reported in, um, uh, in, 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 uh, in the English language press. There was another case that did make it to the front page of the New York Times about uh, a, a year and a half ago um, that was similarly egregious, just, uh, just unbelievable. Uh, but, and, um, but, but you know the, the only thing unusual about cases like these is, is the, the public attention that they receive, right? Getting picked up in the media um, and, and being, um, uh, you know, being, you know, letting the public um, be aware of these cases. The, that, that, those are the only unusual aspects to these cases. Cases like this are, are utterly typical as, as, as I found in the course of, of my research. So I know I'm out of time um, and, and I, I had all these other uh, uh, specific cases. They're all over the book. Like uh, I, I um, provide sort of in-depth case analysis of, of over a hundred individual cases um, throughout, throughout the book. So all these slides that I, uh, that, 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 that I, I prepared. Um, and, and, I, and one thing that I knew that I would not have time to get into would be the, cu the child custody determinations um, and um, just how poorly women fare in general in, in gaining child custody um, and the reasons for that and the, the really striking patterns um, in child custody de determination. So I have two chapters devoted um, to, to that. Um, and, and with that, I will, I will stop here and uh, look forward to questions and comments um, from the audience. Um, great. Um, thank you so much, Professor Michelson. So we will go ahead and take some time for questions now. So just a reminder, and please be sure to type your questions into the question box in your control panel. Now, it looks like we have um, one question from uh, Professor Marty White. So um, Professor Marty White asked, so he asked, uh, what is the background of judges and what is their gender breakdown? And do judge, um, uh, do judge differences have an impact on granting divorce for family violence? And I want to actually add some more question built on um, Professor Marty White's question. So um, Professor Michelson, you mentioned that, um, so judges have some kind of uh, incentives. They um, calculate some kind of metric uh, evaluation standards that um, maybe the government impose on them. So could you please also say um, those, um, explain to the audience those kind of considerations more? And also, um, and also um, you didn't really have a chance to talk about how to actually explain the decreasing uh, rates, successful rates of divorce over time. And could you also talk a little bit about uh, why is this the case? Um, because I assume that actually the level of professionalizations of judges have increased over time and judges have become more and more educated. And um, so why is it the case that, um, so there could be some kind of conflicting uh, considerations and why um, this kind of um, perhaps pressure from the government um, um, becomes so important to them. So could you please just answer this question first and we can move to other question. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, these are fantastic questions. Yeah, thanks, Marty, for, for coming and for, for your, your question. And, and of course, this is something I, I looked for. I mean, I spent a lot of time looking for this. I mean, I, I agonized over, you know, so that the court decisions, they, they, they include the, the names of, of judges. Um, and you, you can see if it was, if there's a panel of three judges, or if there's a mix of, of judges and, and, uh, and lay assessors, or if it was a just a single judge uh, applying the simplified civil civil procedure, but but the the uh, there's we don't know the judge's sex, um, but we can we can we can guess, and and there are all kinds of um, uh, of algorithms that are available um, publicly, thankfully, um, that that allow us to to um, infer uh, someone's sex from their name. It's not perfect, um, but it's it's pretty good. I mean, it's like 75 to 80% of, 
um, accurate. And so I was fully expecting that uh, that female judges would be a lot more sympathetic to um, to female plaintiffs who who, who make um, allegations of domestic violence. And I, I didn't find it. I didn't find it at all. I found no evidence. I mean, it makes no difference. Um, you know, women women judges they they rule no differently than uh, than male judges. Um, you asked about the, the backgrounds um, and and the prevalence um, or you know sort of the gender breakdown of of judges. It's still a minority um, of of judges um, are, are women, about, about a third um, in, in my sample. In Judge Young, a little more, more female judge, better um, female representation on the bench than in, in, uh, in Hunan. Hunan was more like a quarter. Um, and it's going up uh, every year, um, of, of course. And as uh, Yao Wen mentioned, um, you know, judges are become increasingly professionalized as well and more sort of, I guess, you know, just more. Um, more sensitive and, uh, and and more qualified and more educated and and so you would expect these things to to, to make a difference. Um, but I found and and by the way, I should also add that I you know I included um, all of this information that I had about the the um, the composition of uh, of judges, um, the gender representation uh, of of judges making these decisions. They were all control variables in all of my regression uh, models. Everything I present in the book controls for this and. I, I didn't report them uh, in the book. I, I mean, I mentioned that that it didn't make a difference, but I didn't report those coefficients because they they were just not interesting. There was nothing uh, to report there uh, at all. There was no story uh, whatsoever. Um, as for the the um, the evaluation, so yes, you know, judges um, like civil servants um, across the. Uh, Chinese administrative bureaucracy, um, you know, their, their performance is being evaluated. Um, judges are evaluated um, above all on, you know, clearing their dockets on case volume, just closing cases. The more cases that they, they close, um, so the more, you know, they, they get scored primarily um, uh, according to efficiency. Um, but, you know, there are also these sort of stability uh, type measures. Um, they, get, they get punished for um, for for appeals, particularly you know appeals that are overturned um, by the by the appellate court or remanded back to the to the to the lower court for for retrial, the, these things all come back to to ding uh, judges, and so so judges want want things to be uh, they want to minimize contentiousness. They want they want to handle cases that are you know they, they don't want these fraught contentious cases. Um, which is one of the reasons why they just they just deny these uh, deny divorces on the first attempt, and they tell the litigants plainly, they they say I'm not going to grant you the divorce today. You know, you guys work it out, get all your your ducks in a row, uh, come to an agreement on all terms of the divorce, and and come back in, in six months, and then I'll I'll grant you the divorce. But but that's sort of the condition, um, and um, uh. Your 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 other your other question was a really good one, and I and I had the answer in my my head. Remind me. Yeah, the, the other question is um, how to explain the change over oh, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so the, the answer to that is just, it's very very simple. It it um, mm -hmm. the the clampdown the ju the judicial clampdown on divorce it maps perfectly um, on to the China's litigation Stability. explosion the the explosion of civil cases. Um, they, it's like a perfect uh, correlation. So judges are simply overwhelmed. They're overworked. There's, there was an acute shortage of, of judges even before the recent judge quota reform, which cut the number of judges in half. Um, you know, the, the, um, uh, the story of the, the I, I have a whole chapter in the book on the problem of uh, too many cases, too few judges, you know, and mm -hmm. Um, this problem of overworked uh, judges, and and it it really helps lighten their load. It helps judges in a number of ways. If they can close a divorce case by by denying it in in five minutes, um, then it it um, allows them to move on to the next case. Um, it also allows them to uh, increase their efficiency scores, right? Their 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 efficiency numbers. It increases their volume, their efficiency. It reduces the likelihood of of an uh, of an appeal. I mean, it helps judges in so so many ways. And so, you know, I I I, I spent a whole chapter answering the question of the the, the this uh, the judicial clampdown, and it really boils down to uh, to the rise in this just explosion in um, in civil litigation. 
Yeah. Okay. So, um, and actually, I also have other questions. So, um, so China actually has changed a lot over time, but um, at least at one point of time, um, there was growth in civil society and also social movement, uh, feminist movement, um, and women's rights movement, and um, and also the public sphere, and um, and how. I mean, how, how, to what extent, um, and, but of course now um, there, the, the space for this kind of um, uh, activity has been shrinking, but actually, but according to your observation, to what extent this kind of outside, um, outside social forces have influenced the decision-making within the courts, or it doesn't really matter at all, even when there was more political freedom in China. Like larger social like environment changes in larger social um, environments and how kind of social forces outside of the profession can actually shape um, the this influence the decision making within the core system. Well, so I can only answer that question with mm -hmm. respect to to divorce cases. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I can't answer that question with respect to other kinds of cases. What was your your question about sort of in general? Um, um, or can you can actually focus on uh, divorce cases um, specifically? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean the the I mean the influence I think clearly um, has been minimal, minimal to zero uh, influence. Other, otherwise, we wouldn't see this sort of this this just horrific you know the parade of horribles in in the, in China's divorce courts. Um, where, where judges just so routine, they, they, they so brazenly mm -hmm. flout the laws on, on, on the books. I mean, such egregious violations of China's own laws uh, intended to, to protect women. And I, I can only imagine that, uh, that judges are able to get away with this because so few people know about how pervasive these practices are, which is kind of a, interesting, I think, given that these you know, uh, that courts have been posting their decisions online um, they're in the public domain. Anyone can access them and read them. So these these cases um, are hiding in plain sight. My my guess is that it's just you know hard for for people to you know to to analyze them on mass, and that they'd have to. It, it would be hard for them to access them at their finger. I mean, they're sort of they're still buried in like a mountain of of. The, I see there are, there are more more questions. Yeah, on. there are there are two more questions. So the first question is from Terry. So he said, thank you for a very interesting talk. And could you talk a bit about trial custody and whether that might be uh, related to the one child policy and exceptions? And could divorce couple have another trial? And then the second, so we kind of collect two questions. So um, because we don't, we only have one minute left. And um, and um, Tom, um, Professor Tom go ask a question. So he said, congratulations, Ethan, happy new year. And astound, uh, astounding amounts of research and in days gone by the uh, Dan Wei got involved in trying to recon reconcile contentious marriage uh, relations. And does this practice still exist? And you focus on two uh, high major ma majority provinces, any sense of cases in minority areas? So we just have like one minute and please. Yeah, just, um, no, yeah. the, the, the flurry of uh, flurry of questions uh, now. And, and, and if you need to shut down at, uh, at five, that's fine. I can stick around for, mm -hmm. for a little bit if you, if, mm -hmm. if you want. Um, so the, the child, um, the, the one child policy and the exceptions were, weren't, I, I don't think had, had a big influence. I didn't, I didn't see, you know, reading these cases and analyzing them, I, I didn't see a lot of evidence that people were concerned um, uh, about, about this because they were, they were so routinely violated uh, anyway. People have been, you know, for years, even, even before um, it was sort of rescinded or relaxed to become a two child policy. I mean, people were just routinely having, um, in, in the countryside anyway, in, in, in rural uh, uh, areas. Um, so I'm not sure that, that that had a big a big influence. I wish I had more time to talk about child custody because the patterns are just so striking and so interesting and so gendered um, mm -hmm. that and, and so many uh, rural couples did have multiple children and when and child custody were, were the determinations were decided according to the, they're often the child and the parent sex were more matched. Um, so the Dan way now now going to, to Tom's question. Um, there's, I, I didn't see much evidence of that. In the, in the old, old cases, when I was doing the literature review, uh, reading the old Chinese literature, you, you would see the Danwei getting involved and, and gaslighting um, 
women in the same way that judges gaslight women, generally siding with the men, doing what they could to, um, I mean, it was all about mediated reconciliation, right? It was all about mediation to reconcile the couple, to, to, to patch things up and using the same kind of discursive strategies. Um, uh, you know, give him another chance. He, he, he loves you. Stay together for the sake of the children. Um, the, these sorts of, I mean, that, that's sort of what the Danway um, uh, did. Um, the bride price. Uh, I, I, um, uh, I, I, wish, I wish I could get, I mean, people should feel free to just email me uh, these mm -hmm. questions. I'd be more than happy to, to, to continue the, um, uh, the conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. Bill Alford asks about the Fulia, and this is, you know, the All China Women's um, Federation. A absolutely, I mean, kind of a go-to place, um, but generally did the same thing that the Danway did. They, they generally sort of tried to mediate and uh, with the aim of reconciling couples, not so much to advocate for and represent the legal interests of, of women and to help them escape abuse, but rather to help um, uh, preserve uh, the, the marriage. Um, yeah, there has, so Sarah Friedman's question, there, there, there has been discussion of implementing a mediation system outside of the court, not just a discussion, but it's actually been, been happening. There, there is such a system now, a mediation system outside of the, um, outside of the court, but, but still kind of under the umbrella of, of, the, um, of the court. Um, and uh, it, it doesn't seem to be offering much, uh, much, much relief. Uh, that's sort of the quick take uh, on, uh, on that. Oh, and, and the question of the, uh, of, of, you know, and the final question, well, I thought it was the final question before no, no one popped up about, uh, uh, about, about, you know, judges' rulings in divorce cases and the, you know, what we're reading about in the newspapers increasingly frequently about China's sort of looming demographic collapse, right? This, this demographic mm -hmm. crisis, the China's <clears throat> low fertility um, rate. And there's, there's no, no question um, that, you know, the, the political ideology that supports the judicial clampdown on, on divorce um, is to some extent rooted in, in concerns about, uh, about low fertility, below replacement fertility. Um, but it's just the logic just, it, it, it escapes me. I don't understand how anybody, any reasonable person could think that, you know, forcibly uh, preserving toxic marriages will promote childbearing. It just makes no sense um, uh, to me. Yeah. And so it seemed, it seemed that we have run out of time. So, um, and just thank you so much, Professor Michelson, for your insightful talk. And thank you, everyone. And we really appreciate you being here. Um, and, um, and thank you again for joining us today. And we hope to see you next time. And thank you, Ethan. And Happy New Year again. Thank you. Thank you, Yao Wen. And thanks, everybody, for coming. And feel free to get in touch. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.